Um, our next talk is by Hannah Sanderson from Oxford on how learning is enhanced right and the importance of viscosity profiles in determining enhanced right and then the patients. Hi everyone, so my name is Hannah. Um, I'm supervised by Claire and James uh, at Oxford. And so today I'm going to talk to you about how running is an asteroid and um, points of viscosity profiles in magnetic field generation asteroids. And also a quick shout out to Catherine Dodds for helping me get the code running on this one, because she'll help me a lot. Um, this is a presentation I'm actually doing next week at King Oxford as my part of my transfer status, which is a milestone we do in our second year. So feedback is definitely welcome to help me make it better. And it also means apologies if I over explain things because next week I'm going to talk to a lot of people who don't know anything about magnetism. Um, but yeah, so I guess what you've heard a lot about, a lot about so far is magnetism in the early solar system and the nebula field. And now I'm going to move on to talk to you about magnetism generated by bodies early in our solar system inside asteroids. Um, so kind of going to do some background, my aims, and then progress so far because it's very much a work in progress. Um, so why do we care about magnetic fields? Hopefully we're all here because we care about them, um, but just in case you forgot and maybe you want to understand <laughs> why I care about astro-magnetic fields. Um, astro-magnetic fields are really interesting because they give us a way to look inside asteroids uh, and or other planets in general to understand what's happening inside planetary cores, which is not a place we can ever go because um, it's way too hot and way too far away. Um, and it can also tell us about the composition of, our planet, of a core of an asteroid or a planet because it can tell us if we have any compositional convection, whether the core is still liquid, and also the fact that it's electrically conducted in the first place. And it also gives us a way to kind of look back in time to the early solar system to when bodies such as asteroids were hot enough to still be have convecting cores and understand which asteroids were and how they evolved in time, how they then cooled down, whereas today we just kind of see them as cold lumps of rocket space. Um, so that's kind of some reasons why you should be interested. Um, and also just a bit of background for those of you who do more mineralogical stuff. How do rocky bodies actually generate magnetic fields? Um, so in this talk, I'm going to be focusing on magnetic fields generated by convection. Um, firstly, thermal convection, but also compositional convection. Um, so thermal convection is where you have density differences due to changes in temperature. Um, so if you have lighter stuff underneath the stuff, um, dense stuff, then you get the inversion. And then compositional convection is the same thing, but this time the density difference is induced by changes in composition. For example, in the Earth's core, we have a solidifying inner core that's producing our buoyant sulfur impurities, um, which are then driving composition of convection. This is really important in asteroids, but asteroids are going to happen from the top downwards. Um, I'm not talk about that much, but Catherine will later. So listen to that. Um, so, what determines whether an asteroid will actually be able to generate a magnetic field? Um, so, in this talk, I'm going to focus on the thermal evolution aspect of so how a body is cooling down with time. Um, and I'm interested in that kind of for two reasons. Firstly, the core mantle boundary heat flux is going to determine whether or not a body can do thermal convection. Um, it needs to be super adiabatic, so higher than a critical value if we want a thermal dynamo. And also, it determines the thermal structure of the core, and for example, when it's going to begin solidifying, and therefore, whether or not we have uh, compositional convection. So today, I'm going to be trying to explain to you how the viscosity of the asteroid's mantle actually affects the thermal evolution of the whole body, and when different things happen in the core that can lead us to generate magnetic fields. Um, and just in case you can figure it out, I'm focusing on asteroids. Um, and as we've kind of heard already, we have a very pale magnetic record from all the meteorites that we have in the solar system. So we have some actual samples which we can test our ideas about asteroid history, which makes them really interesting. And because they're much smaller than planets, they also have a wider variety of field generation <coughs> mechanisms that we're also seeking to try and understand. Um, and they're the kind of building blocks of things that are on to form our own planets. So understanding how they formed and thermally evolved can tell us how the building blocks of the planets did as well. So that's some background. Hopefully I've convinced you to keep paying attention. So what am I actually trying to do? Um, so this is kind of what I'm doing in my whole PhD. Um, today I'm going to be focusing on the first part, so thinking about mantle viscosity and how that affects dynamo generation. Hopefully when that is all kind of wrapped up, I'm then going to try and link to specific meteorites and their compositions to figure out what realistic viscosity profiles are. And then hopefully later in my PhD, I'm going to expand on some work that Catherine has done on crystal loading convection. But I'm not going to focus on that today, but you can enjoy the nice picture. So what have I done so far? So, so far, a lot of my effort has been building a thermal evolution model of asteroid evolution. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar, here is a kind of cartoon of what happens in an asteroid's life. Um, so firstly, we have the accretion of chondritic material. Um, so bits of undifferentiated material come together and they form an asteroid. 
Then we have radiogenic heating by adding aluminium sticks. This is going to heat up portions of our asteroid and melt it, and that can lead to the formation of a mantle, which is shown here in green, and then a um, metal core where yellow is hot and red is cold. Initially, the core is hot at the top and cold at the bottom because the radiogenic isotopes partition into the mantle, so we get heating from the top of the core. Um, so when, as this happens, the mantle begins to convect because it's getting hotter and runnier, but the core cannot convect because it's got this layer of hot, less dense material on top of a denser, cold layer, and that's gravitation stable and fine. So eventually, once the whole mantle is convecting, then heat begins to be transferred from, as the mantle begins to cool, and then we get heat being taken out of the core and erosion of thermal stratification until eventually we get to this step where you can see the whole core can then begin to convect. This is the point at which we can start to generate a magnetic field. Um, so we can have the mantle convecting and the core convecting, and we can have thermal dynamos. Um, and then later on, the mantle is still cooling. So eventually the body, the mantle convection will stop, and it'll begin to conduct. And then that can either lead to cessation of core convection, um, because you're not having as high as heat flux into the core mantle boundary. But then later, as I'll explain later in my talk, you could begin to have compositional convection as the core begins to solidify. Um, so what I've done so far is take this, use some equations to put it into a computer, spend a lot of time debugging, and then eventually get out down the timing, duration, and strength. And these are the things I actually care about. Um, as it's work in progress, steps one and step one and step two of the differentiation still need some work, but steps three to five are done. Um, so here are some nice plots. We created some existing models. So I've mostly been trying to recreate some work by James from 2019 and Catherine from 2021. Um, and just to talk you through kind of what's happening here, so what my model actually does. We've got a black line, which is the core, and then the red line is the mantle. So we can see initially we have radiogenic heating. Um, so <coughs> the mantle and core both heat up, and then the mantle is going to be is convecting um, and begins to cool. Um, and the core cools, but it's slower because it's got this big hot mantle on top of it. And then there reaches a point where the mantle becomes essentially solid and it's just conducting. And at that point, we see a jump in temperature as the mantle and the core become at the same temperature because rather than having a stagnant layer convection and then like a boundary with a big temperature gradient across it, the whole thing just becomes, it just conducts through. Um, it shouldn't really be that sharp, but computers have finite time steps. Um, and then things keep cooling. So how does this relate to magnetic field generation? Um, there is a lot on this slide, so I'll just talk through it. Um, we use a thing called the magnetic Reynolds number to understand whether or not a body can generate a magnetic field. If it's higher than a critical value, which in this case is shown by the black dashed line, then essentially we can have a magnetic field. Yeah. Um, and then what I've got here, I've got three, but both these scales are logarithmic. So the magnetic Reynolds number here goes from one to 100. And then we've got time also logarithmically. So this is the early time of the body and then this is later times. And then I've got three different blue lines, which are different model run model runs. Don't worry too much about them just yet. Um, the key thing to note is that sometimes they are above this line here and sometimes they're below it. So the first time that the models go above the black dash line is a thermal dynamo. This is early in the body's um, history. The mountains began to connect. The heat flux out the core is high enough we can have a thermal dynamo. And what you can see is that two of these lines come <laughs> up above the critical value pretty early on. Um, whereas this the third model um, comes up about seven million years later, um, which, and this is because these different models had different viscosities, and that's leading to a seven million year difference in when the thermal dynamo starts. And then we can kind of see they end at roughly the same time. Then over here, the second set of dynamos, these are compositional dynamos. So later in the body's history, the mantle will stop convecting, and it's conducting, but eventually the core begins to solidify. And as the core begins to solidify, we may be able to generate fields through compositional mechanisms. And again, we can see here that two of our models go, we can generate dynamo at the same time, but there's a 450 million year difference um, between the onset time of this compositional dynamo and the onset time of this compositional dynamo. Um, and again, this is just, I've taken three different models with different viscosity profiles. So it's quickly becoming apparent that viscosity is important for when dynamos can start and stop. So what actually do I mean when I say viscosity profile and how can we bring that out? Um, so, so I'm talking kind of through what happens as the body cools down. So here on the left, I've got a cartoon of the crystal kind of structure inside the mantle. And then on the right, I've got the viscosity profile with temperature or melt fraction that we're then putting into our models. 
So first, when we're at low melt fractions and fairly low temperatures, we just have a kind of kinetics Arrhenius relationship um, between viscosity and temperature. And you can see kind of there's lots and lots of crystals and kind of the creep mechanisms might get faster with high temperatures, so they increase a bit. The viscosity decreases a bit, but it's not that interesting. It's just a kind of solid. Then when we get to a certain critical melt fraction, we reach the point where melt surrounds all the solid grains. And this is called the rheologically critical melt fraction. And at this point, um, essentially, it begins, the viscosity drops very rapidly because it goes from being very much like a solid to pretty much like a liquid. Um, so we get this steep drop that you can see here. And then eventually, when we have loads and loads of melt and basically no crystals, we actually have a liquid, and then we have a constant kind of liquid viscosity above a certain melt fraction. So that's how it's kind of been modeled in the past. Um, and this is also not only affected by temperature, it's also affected by composition. Um, so here are some examples of different magnets of different um, silica contents. And we can see that on this scale here, it's again logarithmic, we've got kind of eight orders of magnitude difference in viscosity between a rhyolite and a basalt. And again, the water content also can have an effect on viscosity. So when we're understanding viscosity, we have to think about temperature, we have to think about composition, we have to think about water content. Um, and those all things I'm hoping to eventually incorporate in my models. Um, so what have we done so far? And people have done their previous models of asteroids. So, so far, um, kind of we've had three papers that have all looked at dynamos and asteroids, and they've all kind of used the same viscosity profile, um, but like tweaked it slightly to make it slightly better to put in that model. Um, so you can see for all of them, we've got the same slope I showed you earlier. Our rheologically critical map fraction is 0.5, and then we've got different levels of steep drop-off to a constant value. Um, so initially I put these in my models because like, I'm recreating previous literature. Um, but how does this actually relate to experiments? Um, so these are some experiments that were partly used as the foundation of the viscosity profile from the first paper. And as you can kind of see, they are not the same. Um, so there are some key differences to look at. Firstly, we've got this difference between the experimental critical mount fraction and the model one. So in the models, the critical mount fraction is at 0.5 and experiments, the critical mount fraction is at 0.3. And also the reference viscosity here is at 10 to the 14, whereas here is 10 to the 22. Um, so there are already some quite big differences. And that's partly because these models took a reference viscosity from the Earth's mantle, which from first thought might seem reasonable, but then you remember that the asteroids are much, much lower pressures than the Earth. So actually an Earth mantle viscosity uh, may be way too high. Um, so in short, we definitely need to do work here. So what I did was, now I took three different viscosity profiles and that's the three profiles that I showed you earlier. So we've got our original profile from James's paper in 2019. Then I've put one profile with a lower critical map fraction lying <coughs> in the experimental region. And I got one model with a lower reference viscosity but I left the critical map fraction as it was. Um, so I've changed, in each model I've changed one thing to try and make it closer to the experiments. And then again, to remind you what that did, here's the plot I showed you earlier. And so we can now see what effect that has had. So we can see here that both of the new modified models had a dynamo onset seven million years earlier than the published um, viscosity model. And then for the compositional dynamo, changing the reference viscosity to 10 to the 14 has led to this 450 million year difference in compositional dynamo onset, whereas the critical map fraction hasn't changed that much. Um, so this is all work in progress. This is kind of the two profiles I've run so far. But the plan now is to run a systematic sweep through critical amount fractions, reference viscosities, and other parameters of composition to figure out how these things will affect dynamo start and end time and duration. Um, so yeah, that's what I'm doing in the future. And then hopefully after I've done that, I'm going to try and link that to actual meteorite compositions to understand what profiles are most realistic for the meteorites that we have and see if that can help us understand the paleomagnetic record that we see. Um, and which new tries can and can't generate those okay. fields. Um, thank you. Um, questions for me? Uh, so, my feedback is that I was really excellent and very, very clear talk. Um, so, my question is relates to when the core starts to um, solidify, um, that will simply release latent peaks. And then that comes in Earth and that helps drive it in my mind. Mm -hmm. But here we're going to hinder it because it's something at the top of the core. So, uh, do you think that affects significantly you include it in your model? Um, so, at the moment, just to get the code running, I'm currently using eutectic solidification. Um, when I, because composition is made kind of problem, I think 
it will probably change the duration of dynamo and potentially when it starts. But eventually, if you've got enough heat being taken out of the core, you feel really stimulating heat, and you're still going to be producing things of two different densities because it's the density of that's going to drive the convection, even if you've got no heat being waste. So I think it shouldn't be too much of a problem. Um, but we'll chat later if you want. Any more questions online? Yeah. One question, you can unmute and ask. Uh, uh, hi, uh, Hannah, sorry. Um, first of all, great talk. I'm sure your uh, report next week is going to do, uh, go uh, swimmingly. Uh, just for my own information, you know, one of the things we think about that's important for generating a geomagnetic field is the rotation rate, you know, and that's often encompassed in the Ekman number. You didn't mention anything about uh, rotation required to generate a um, meteoritic magnetic field. Uh, I wonder if you can tell me why that is. Um, so the rotation rate does come into the magnetic manifest Reynolds number that I used to determine to scale from a heat flux to uh, whether or not a field can be generated. So I'm not currently explicitly investigating it. Um, I guess that would be something I could think about in the future, depending on how much the it, it would be varied between different asteroids. But I think that the variation in viscosity between different bodies is probably going to be larger than their variation rotation rates, given they're all forming kind of dynamically in quite similar ways, um, and all of them affected by similar dynamical effects in the disk. So, but you do need those bodies to be rotating. Um, yes. Okay, thank you. Time for one more question. Is there any? Um, yeah, yeah, great, great presentation. Um, you showed some data that you published it. Was it yeah. Is that experimental data or yeah. was that based on a, a, a sort of calculation? Um, so that's experimental data of like compressive triassic group experiments. Okay. Um, there's quite a lot of them out there. And to kind of, another job is going to be to sift through them all and figure out which ones are reliable, but that's what's kind of been used there for these people. I mean, I guess that there are probably got a model values you can use based on dissipation models and that kind of thing, but I guess you then need to know things like grain size and yeah. things like that. I guess we don't we only guess what the grain size is yeah. in the mantle and all those asteroids, and we might have some evidence of each record, I guess. Um, but yeah, I guess there are people here working on, on mantle viscosity as a you know, the various different mechanisms and models for that, so that might be something to, to yeah, I think explore beyond the experiments are harder. Yeah. Modeling is. Just try to do the thing we go. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.